Okay, great. Hi, everybody. Well, it's a, it's a great pleasure to have um, Mike with us um, to, to discuss the last two chapters of the profit from your forecasting software. Um, so I'll leave it to Mike to introduce um, himself. Um, I, I, I don't know actually your position, Mike, in, in SAS, to be honest. But okay. He's the IAF Director, International Install Forecast and Director. And then he, he's working in, um, in SAS, but I leave it to Mike uh, to introduce himself. Uh, and then thank you very much for your, uh, your support, Mike, uh, with this session. Great, thank you. Hello, everyone. This is Mike Gilliland. I am Product Marketing Manager for SAS Forecasting Software. Also uh, work as Associate Editor on the IAF's Practitioner Journal, Foresight. Um, and first, I'd like to thank Bauman for organi organizing the Forecasting Book Club and for inviting me to present. Uh, I've been watching the sessions on YouTube, so it's been good to see friends like Bauman and Paul and Fodios, and then several other new folks I haven't previously met. And also, special thanks to Paul for writing such a practical and easy reading book. Uh, just a little about myself, my undergrad was in philosophy at Michigan State University, and I have a master's degrees in philosophy and in mathematical sciences from Johns Hopkins. My first professional job was in 1985 as an operations research analyst uh, at a division of Kraft Foods. And that's where I first started working in forecasting. Although I had no formal training in the topic at that time, uh, there just wasn't much being taught on the subject at the universities in those days. So let's get into the book. Um, Paul's chapter on new product forecasting, he references book by Ken Kahn from 2006 called New Product Forecasting and Applied Approach. So I wanna start with a few things from Kahn's book. Kahn identifies several kinds of new product forecasting situations that you can encounter. There are refinements of existing products. For example, a new improved version, such as a laptop with a faster processor, or more memory, or an improved toothpaste. Or there are refinement, or the refinements are sometimes just packaging or labeling changes. There could be new markets for existing products, such as expanding a regional brand nationwide or globally. And then there are new to the world products, for example, uh, you know, the first smartphone. What's common to all these situations, as Paul points out, is that there is little or no sales history data that can be used for extrapolation or to estimate relationships between sales and predictive variables. Now, Khan also points out that there are several new product forecasting approaches. Uh, executive opinion or decree, something I like to call evangelical forecasting, is where a top executive tells you the forecast based on what they want the forecast to be without regard to data or evidence. In my years as a forecasting practitioner in consumer products companies, I found this to be a very common approach. If your general manager or division president didn't like what the forecasting department presents, they just change the forecast to something they like and there's nobody who can stop them. The Salesforce roll-ups, this is where you have a bottoms up poll of what your salespeople think is gonna happen. Now, some argue that this is a good method because salespeople are closest to the customer and should know best what future demand is going to be. But this assumes that salespeople are skilled at forecasting, which they probably aren't. And even if they can forecast future demand perfectly, it assumes that they'll be honest when providing their forecasts. And the problem here is that there may be no motivation for salespeople to tell the truth. Instead, if their forecasts are going to be used to make sales quotas, they'll naturally bias the forecast low, so they'll have easier to achieve targets. And once the quotas are set, they may be biased to forecast too high to make sure plenty of inventory is available so they won't lose any sales to shortages. Now, I personally don't think requiring salespeople to forecast is a good use of their time. I'd rather they be out playing golf with customers, building relationships and selling product, rather than probably wasting time preparing forecasts that are untrustworthy and unhelpful. And if, for more discussion of this role of uh, salespeople in forecasting, I refer you to this Foresight article from 2014. Uh, the Delphi method is a structured formal process for non anonymously gathering forecasts although it's not commonly used in practice in, in my experience. Our participants provide their forecasts anonymously along with written reasons to support their estimates. A coordinator compiles the forecasts and the reasons along with 
prepares some summary statistics and sends all the information back to the participants for a second round. Participants can then see this new information, revise their forecasts, uh, send them back to the coordinator, and the process can be repeated a couple of times until a point forecast is adopted, usually from the median of the last set of participant forecasts. This method has the advantage of anonymity. So participants can perhaps be more honest than they would be if they're speaking in front of their peers and managers. But there is a disadvantage compared to a well-run meeting where there's gonna be a more dynamic sharing of information. And because of being anonymous, one argument is, the participants may not try as hard to create good quality forecasts. So you're not really getting their best, uh, best mental efforts in creating the numbers. Prediction markets are a more recent innovation, gaining some limited traction in business forecasting over the last 20 or so years, although still used mostly for things like political uh, election forecasting. Prediction markets are another way of getting information anonymously from multiple participants. Participants trade shares in something like a stock market where the price is indicative of the size of their forecast. So you can get the benefit of perspectives from multiple participants who can react in real time to changes in information and they have a financial incentive to put effort into their forecast. However, there's no sharing of information or justification provided for the trades, and there can be wild swings in prices without sound reasons behind them. And finally, there's forecasting by analogy, which is a very popular method, where you expect the new product sales to be like previous new products that are similar, and diffusion modeling, which looks at how ownership of new products spreads through populations. In chapter 10, I just discusses these last two approaches. But first, Paul gives us a warning about the, the uh, use of pure unstructured judgment in new product forecasting. As was, point, as was pointed out last week by Fotios, chapter nine on judgmental interventions, there's a lot of potential disadvantages when you rely on judgment for forecasting. Now recall the cognitive biases that Paul identified. There's recency where you are more influenced by the success or failure of a recent launch. There's optimism. Are you only remembering the successes and ignoring the high percentage of new products that have failed? Advocacy. Uh, does the forecast have to be at a certain level to be approved for development? If you are the person with a new product idea, then for sure you'll forecast sales to be at least as high enough to exceed that approval hurdle. And there's groupthink where people may be reluctant to express genuine concerns, especially if a dominating leader supports the product. Paul also interestingly points out the issue of biased feedback. Now we can generally improve our performance in anything we're doing by receiving feedback on our performance. But new product forecasting, we only get feedback on the sales of new products that go to market. We don't get feedback on our forecast for new products that ultimately are not developed and not released into market. So although there are dangers in using unstructured judgment in new product forecasting, we should note that there are still legitimate reasons or situations where you have to use judgment. Now, unfortunately, we're pretty much stuck with judgment when there's no historical data, such as for new products, or in other situations where data is difficult or costly to collect. For example, introducing a new product in the test market could provide valuable information prior to a global release. However, test markets have costs, take time, and delay the global release. Judgment can also compensate for lack of future information. Market research might provide valuable insights, but takes time and money to conduct. And some things like the direction of a fad or fashion maybe just can't be quantified. So let's take a look at a variation of forecasting by analogy called the structured analogy approach. But the use of analogies is a very common practice. Anyone who has bought or sold real estate is familiar with the idea of comparables or comps, similar properties in similar neighborhoods that have recently sold to give an indication of the market value of the property under consideration. An analogy should be used all the time for new product forecasting. For example, if the new product is a simple refinement of an existing product, you might expect the new version will continue the same sales pattern as the prior version. In the structured analogy approach, forecasting by analogy is utilized with structured judgment. Basically, you try to provide some historical context along with some basic statistical analysis, to try to get a good sense of the likely range of outcomes for the new product. 
So rather than just completely pulling numbers out of the air with no justification whatsoever, you're trying to validate that the judgmental decisions you're making are reasonable. And it's easy to understand this process through an example. Um, the approach begins with a classification of attributes of each of your products, the new product as well as the current products and historical products that are no longer active. There's really no limit to the kinds of attributes you can associate with each product, what type of product it is, when it was introduced, the financial aspects like selling price and competitor pricing, like demographics about the expected purchaser and specifics about the physical nature of the product, like size and color. Note that some of the attributes may be difficult or impossible to quantify, so you maybe can't capture everything. Now, while Paul worked through an example of a pharmaceutical product, I'm going to work through a different example of movie DVD sales. Now, DVD sales probably aren't the most uh, relevant example today because DVDs have largely been supplanted by streaming of movie content. But DVD deals have a peculiar sales pattern that makes for a nice illustration of the structured analogy process. When a movie DVD is released, sales tend to be highest in the first week and then quickly taper off. So here we're looking at graphs of 100 uh, new releases, the first eight weeks of sales of DVD movies. And although there are some exceptions, they generally follow that pattern of maximum sales the first week before dropping off to almost zero after eight weeks. This process I'm going to describe was developed by colleagues of mine in SAS R&D, and one of the big benefits is how it automates the extraction and visualization of the data, scaling the sales volume appropriately so you can focus on the shape of the pattern, as you see here. Software alone uh, will not provide a magic solution to new product forecasting. There's going to be judgment required throughout the structured analogy process. But the software facilitates the process, doing a lot of the grunt work, so you don't have to do the anal all the analysis manually. Now, in this process, first you have the query step. As a forecaster, you make a judgment on what attributes of the new product you think are relevant. The system then queries the full database of past new product introductions and their attributes to select a set of candidate products that have attributes similar to the new product. Next is the filter step. Here again, you use judgment to remove any products you consider outliers or otherwise inappropriate and do additional clustering or filtering to narrow the list down to a set of surrogate products. These are the ones you think are really most appropriate as analogies to the new product. The model step and finds a statistical model that seems to be the most appropriate fit to the surrogate products. And finally, the forecast and override step uses the selected model to generate the forecast for the new product and lets you make a final judgment by manually uh, adjusting the statistical forecast. Now, working to the DVD example, suppose the new movie is an R-rated horror movie, and we think these are the two important attributes. So the system extracts the set of candidate products uh, all models with genre equal horror and rating equal R. Here in the query step, the graph on the top shows all candidates over, overlaid over their first 20 weeks of sales. It hasn't been scaled, so you see the weekly sales volumes. All of the movies follow a similar pattern except for one, Dawn, we find is Dawn of the Dead, which has a sales hump at week five. So, one option is we can use our judgment and remove it from the candidate list, which we've done in the bottom graph. In the filter step, we had the system scale the sales into percentage of sales per week rather than units sold, and then cluster the candidates. In this example, there were three clusters, and we use judgment to select cluster one as our surrogate. We feel this is the most likely pattern the new product will follow. Next, in the model step, different types of models are created and evaluated over the set of surrogates. You again make a judgment and decide which model to select for generating the new product forecast. Finally, forecasts are created, and after exploring the various views of the forecast and the prediction interval, you're able to make a final act of judgment and manually override any forecasts before sending them to downstream planning systems. So to conclude on this approach, structure and analogy is appropriate in many situations, especially when you have a large pool of previous new product introductions to serve as the analogy candidates. It incorporates statistical analysis and data visualization with human judgment, 
working together in combination to create the new product forecast. What I consider its key benefit is that it lets the computer do the computational grunt work, extracting and presenting the data, and the visualizations give you a good sense of the range of possible outcomes and the risk of uncertainty in the forecast you choose. Now, sometimes I've seen our sales or marketing people pitch this as a new product forecasting system, as if it's going to generate a highly accurate new product forecast for you. But I don't see it in this, in this way at all. From what I've observed in my industry jobs, new product forecasts come from all sorts of places in the organization, uh, generally generated by all kinds of methods, all kinds of different people. I su suspect that that will continue to be the case with forecasts often based on pure unstructured judgment alone. So to me, the value of the approach is not so much in generating forecasts, but serving as a bullshit detector. I hope that's a term that translates internationally a bullshit detector for the forecast coming from elsewhere in the organization. It provides a way to review and assess a new product forecast based on the context of previous new products. It lets you evaluate the forecast coming from a product manager or division president or from where, where from ever, and determine whether that forecast you're being given is reasonable or if it's pure bullshit. Let's next look at Paul's discussion of diffusion modeling. Um, the best diffusion model is based on the expected behavior of different types of potential customers, referred to as innovators and imitators. Innovators are keen to buy the product as soon as they hear about it. They're eager to try it for themselves, not waiting to hear what other purchasers have to say about it, like these folks in line at the Apple store. Imitators only buy the product after hearing about others' experience with it. For example, hearing about the benefits of the product. They feel this reduces the risk of the product disappointing them and being a waste of money. The BAS model takes into account these two different behaviors. The graph shows what the innovators, the, the uh, dotted line, and the imitators, the dashed line, and the combined total of new adopters in red, what these might look like over time. Note that the total number of units sold may be larger than the number of adopters. And this is because people may make multiple purchases of the product. To run a BAS model, you need estimates of three things, uh, the market size, the total number of potential adopters, and two parameters, P and Q, that both can range between zero and one. Uh, P is the coefficient of innovation. It represents the tendency of people to buy because of advertising and media exposure they've seen. And Q is the coefficient of imitation represents the tendency of people to buy based on what they've heard from other people's purchases. It's word of mouth. Note that the power of word of mouth becomes stronger as more people have adopted the product, so the rate of adoption increases. But eventually, the total number of adopters uh, approach the market saturation point. So there are few remaining laggards who haven't yet made a purchase, and the number of adopters slows. Here is the computation of the BAS model. I'm not gonna go through the details of it, but as you see, it's based on the parameters P and Q and other numbers that can be derived from the total market size. Again, I'm not gonna to try to work through a calculation here, but basically once you have the first, if, if once you have the first few periods of a new product sales, then a BAS curve can be fitted to the data <clears throat> to estimate the market size P and Q. If the product hasn't yet been launched, there's no sales history, you can estimate the parameters from previously launched analogous products. For the market size estimate when there's no history, you may be better off using consumer intention surveys, demographic data, or other means to make the size estimate. And once you have the estimates of the three parameters, you can use them to forecast the future periods. Paul warns us to always check the forecast for reasonableness, especially if based on no or very little history. Now, Paul also recognizes several limitations of the BAS model. One, it's designed to adopt for forecast adoptions, that is new buyers, not total sales. So the BAS model is probably most appropriate for durable goods, like for example, a washing machine, which you buy once and then not again for another 20 years later when it breaks. Now, the model probably wouldn't be helpful forecasting fast moving consumer goods like packaged food or beverages you're buying in a, in a grocery store things that you buy over and over again. 
Of course, the estimate of P and Q has a big influence on the adoption forecast, so those must be chosen wisely based on the most appropriate analogies. The basic mass model assumes that the market size as well as P and Q remain unchanged, but this fails to account, uh, take into account things like increased advertising, price reductions, or competition. There are extensions of the model that try to take these things into consideration. There are other types of S-shaped curves that may better fit the cumulative number of adopters. And not all products follow this pattern with a single peak of adoption. Some have an early peak, fall off somewhat before they again regain popularity and, and hit another peak. Now, I have never used the best model in any of my forecasting jobs. So when we get uh, to the discussion section, I'd be interested to hear if anyone's experience with it. I want to end the chapter 10 discussion with some observations on worst practices in new product forecasting. These are based on an article I did several years ago for the Journal of Business Forecasting. And I like to talk about worst practices because throughout my industry career, I've probably committed every one of them at some point during my career as well as ended, invented some new ones. Uh, I try to encourage people to try new things and share new mistakes they uncover because there's no value in repeating the same old mistakes I was making 35 years ago at the start of my career. New product forecasting is probably the most difficult type of forecasting. Organizations sometimes have to put themselves at great risk, maybe even betting the company on a promising new product idea. Yet the foundations upon which new product forecasts are made can be very shaky or even implausible. The most fundamental worst practice is to have unrealistic expectations for the accuracy of a new product forecast, especially if you then place a dangerous bet on the assumption that the new product forecast will be accurate because it probably won't be. Reverse engineering the forecast is when you create justifications for a forecast to meet some predetermined hurdle. For example, new product ideas may not be developed unless there is a forecast showing a minimum amount of revenue and profit from them. So if you're a product manager with a new product idea, of course, you're going to provide a forecast that meets the minimum level needed for approval. So rather than trying to objectively and scientifically come up with a realistic forecast, we're going to just find reasons to justify the level that's needed. We've discussed forecasting by analogy at length and when done properly in a structured approach, it has its merit. But when there's no structure around the application of judgment and the forecaster is free to select whatever analogies he or she wishes to, then they might only include only successful past new product introductions, cherry picking the most favorable analogies and ignoring all the failures. This is one of the cognitive biases that Paul warned about. When there's a lot of uncertainty about forecast, the forecast going ahead, sometimes the best thing to do is just flatline the forecast at some average value you think is appropriate. And of course, real life sales never come in perfectly flat. They're invariably wiggly with ups and downs due to trend and seasonality, long-term cycles and randomness. So while the most appropriate forecast may be a flat line, managed may attack it for not being wiggly enough because it doesn't look like what sales were turn out to be. The worst practice would be to add ups and downs to the forecast, even if there's no sound justification to do so. The Holden roll occurs when sales for, uh, short, shortfalls are rolled ahead into future periods on the assumption that the fort shortfall will be made up. Now, I first observed this while working in a consumer electronics company. A quarterly forecast will be agreed upon and broken down into months. When the first month of sales came in, if they fell before the forecast, the difference would be added to the next two months to maintain the quarter. If we were still behind after the first two months, the shortfall would be added to the third month. So we would still claim to be on plan for the quarter. My colleague, Charlie Chase, has a humorous example in his book, Demand Driven Forecasting. And quoting from the book, it's so a common response to the question, what makes you think you can make up last month's missed demand next month, is that the sales organization will be more focused. But then you ask, but weren't they focused last month? And yes, they answer, but they will be more focused next month. As you can imagine, the Holden rule is a really bad practice and for a lot of reasons. And it's also illogical, because if you're constantly falling short of your forecast, and probably the more logical thing to do is to lower your future forecasts and not raise them. 
new products are not released in isolation, rather they're part of a portfolio of the company's offerings. Now, sometimes a product is completely new in a new area of business or in a new geographic region, so sales volume will be purely incremental. But most of the time, the product will compete with similar products that company already offers, so it would be wrong to model the new product sales as distinct and independent of the full portfolio. Cannibalization and even halo effects are likely, as well as phase-in and phase-out effects when the new product is intended to replace its predecessor. So ignoring the new product's place in the overall product portfolio can be a mistake. So summarize, overall, my feeling is that if you have high expectations for accurate new product forecasting, you're going to be very disappointed. It's probably a good idea to use multiple methods to generate new product forecasts. You can take advantage of the benefits of combining models that give different perspectives, and you also get a sense of the range of likely outcomes. Try to avoid pure gut feel judgment and use a more structured judgmental approach. And if the BAS model is appropriate to your situations, just be aware of its limitations. Let's move on now to Paul's last chapter, summary of guidance for using your forecasting software in a blueprint for best practices. Uh, Paul begins by itemizing the desirable characteristics of forecasting software. He calls these the obvious characteristics, the things that everyone would expect. A fast, easy-to-use interface is probably first on just about everyone's list of software features. He then goes through several perhaps less obvious characteristics that are necessary or at least very helpful to have in your software. Data preparation is a huge concern in many companies. Data quality is poor both inconsistent and incomplete, and data may be disorganized and difficult to access. Are there master files for all products and their attributes, all company locations, all customers and their locations and attributes? Um, you hear some numbers thrown around, such as that for a data scientist, 80 to 90% of their time is spent just preparing the data, with only 10 to 20% of their time on the actual analysis. This can hold in forecasting as well. It's helpful to have facilities for handling missing values, for outliers, and things like trading day adjustments and other data transformations. If these capabilities aren't built into the forecasting software, you'll need another tool to do these things. Visualization of the data is very helpful. For example, a graph of sales history with a forecast lets you apply a sanity check on the reasonableness of the forecast. Or plots of residuals are useful in determining uh, whether forecasting methods have extracted all the useful predictive information from the data or checking other assumptions. Here are some various visualizations I pulled off of Google Images. Now, it's common for large organizations to have thousands or even millions of forecasts to create each period, so automatic modeling is essential. But the method for selecting models is a key consideration. Crudely picking the model with the best fit to history can result in overfitting. Overfitting that model to randomness in the data and often, and often leads to poor quality forecasts. It's surprising how much software uses best fit selection. It sounds like a good idea. Shouldn't the model that best, best fits the history give the best forecast? But years of evidence and M competition results show that this is not the case. The quality of ARIMA models has noticeably improved over the years precisely because of recognizing and avoiding overfitting. Good software will provide for holdout samples to test models that have been fit with the in-sample training period data. And since there's no single perfect measure of forecasting performance, multiple fit and accuracy measures are good to have. <clears throat> for example, SAS forecasting software contains over 40 metrics to choose from. It's also good to have things like rolling origin evaluation, so you can assess forecasts over different lead times. There's a huge body of evidence on the value of combining combination or ensemble models. So it's desirable for forecasting software to allow this. I would go so far as to argue that software vendors should make ensembles the default and only select an individual model for very good reasons. Events, both planned and unplanned, can have a great effect on demand patterns and the software should be able to handle them. Unplanned events are things like natural disasters, say a flood or a hurricane or so on. Uh, when, when these impact your history, you should be able to address them as special events in the model to recognize that that period is not normal demand behavior. 
planned events are things like price changes or promotional activities. These should be noted in the history so you can determine their approximate effect. And then known future events can be used in modeling to create presumably more accurate forecasts. There may be other predictive variables such as the weather or economic conditions that you'd like the option to be able to include in modeling. It's hard to imagine trying to do large scale forecasting and organization without the time series being organized into hierarchies. For businesses, there's usually a product hierarchy, which finished items roll up into product groups and categories and brands, and in a location hierarchy where customer ship to locations roll into warehouses or distribution centers, into manufacturing plants and other supply sources. You need to be able to do top down, bottoms up, and middle out reconciliation of the forecasts that have been created at each node of the hierarchy. And over the last 10 years or so, there's been great attention put on temporal hierarchies where you utilize the information carried in different temporal frequencies, reconcile them to create more accurate forecasts. The electric utility industry is a prime example where this is valuable. Electricity demand varies based on season of the year, day of the week, time of day, and temporal reconciliation makes use of all these patterns. Now we're all used to dealing with point forecast, a single number indicating our best guess of the demand in a particular period. But for planning purposes, such as how much inventory to keep, it's essential to have some estimate of the uncertainty in that forecast. For example, if the forecast is 100 plus or minus 10, you could carry less safety stock compared to a forecast of 100 plus or minus 100. Uncertainty can be expressed in a number of ways, such as prediction intervals, fan charts, and full predictive densities. Paul has a nice article discussing these alternatives in foresight. Just remember that common methods of computing prediction intervals underestimate the uncertainty, often dramatically. So if the software gives you the 95% PI, you're probably safe in assuming that more than 5% of future observations will fall outside that 95% PI. For all the bad things that can happen when judgment is applied to a statistical forecast, it's still necessary to have the ability to make judgmental adjustments. Methods like forecast value added analysis, which Paul covered in chapter three, help identify when adjustments are doing harm and making the forecast worse. And over the last couple of years, there have been some promising innovations in using machine learning to guide the adjustment of statistical forecasts. There have been presentations by the serial company Kellogg's and by SAS Research and Development, showing methods to identify which forecasts are most likely to benefit from an adjustment and by how much. And the winter 2021 issue of Foresight will have an article by consultant Jeff Baker that uses machine learning and behavioral economics to guide you whether or not you should make a forecast adjustment. Robert Files and I are also providing commentaries on that article. So many organizations have a process where upper management <coughs> reviews and approves or adjusts the final forecast. So Paul argues for good tools to present forecast to management for their understanding and buy-in. For example, not only should there be good graphical display of the history and forecast, but also non-technical explanation of the assumptions and rationale for the forecast. And critically, there should be some indication of the level of uncertainty. That concludes Paul's summary of the desirable characteristics of forecasting software. But before we finish with his blueprint for forecasting best practices, I want to extend the topic into an overlooked area of actually implementing a forecasting solution. An alarming percentage of major software implementations fail to be delivered on time, on budget, or even at all. Implementations of new forecasting software or forecasting processes are not immune from this legacy of failure. Let's take a look at why implementations fail and what we can do about it. Well, first we need to consider perceived implementation failure versus true failure. Any project that doesn't deliver what was expected or promised will be perceived as a failure. In forecasting, this is often because of unrealistic expectations that have been set by the software vendors or the consultants or implementation team doing the work. An implementation may deliver meaningful forecasting improvement, yet still be perceived as failing because of overpromising and improperly managed expectations. True failures occur when the implementation was never completed, when the software was never installed. Often, much more than you might expect, the new forecasting software is installed, but is never fully adopted by the forecasters and is not used. 
And there's also failure when the new software process is implemented and used, but just isn't any good at forecasting and doesn't improve, improve upon what was done before. We've seen why projects fail. Now, you know, what can we do about it? I suggest it begins with a project uh, pre-project uh, pre assessment, a realistic evaluation of IT infrastructure and capabilities. Does the organization have the right data elements available? Master files for items and customers, clean and complete history of orders and shipments, all the basic building blocks of a forecasting system. Does the IT department have good data management practice in place so the files are kept clean and updated? And does the organization have resources in IT or elsewhere with the skills to handle both the software implementation and the change management? Or will outside consultants and contractors be required to assist in the project? <clears throat> Large software purchases are often initiated through an initial request for information or request for a proposal from multiple vendors. The process has many serious flaws and inefficiencies. The RFI or RFP is often a lengthy document, sometimes 50 pages or more, full of minute and detailed questions about capabilities of the software. Response is made through checkboxes for each question, indicating the capability that's, that, that's asked for is available now, available in the next release, available with customization, or not available. Answering not available on any question can disqualify the vendor from further consideration. So pretty much every vendor will claim the product that their product has every capability, at least with customization. To me, this is a ridiculous exercise and merely serves to expose that the customer has little understanding of their own business problem or what it will take to solve it. You'll see questions like software uses big data or software uses machine learning or whatever is a hot buzzword of the day. Requiring these kinds of capabilities presupposes that they're necessary to solve the business problem, but you know, maybe they aren't, probably they aren't. Further problem is that vendor selection is often fixed. The customer already knows who they're going to choose, but they have to go through the proposal process as a formality, so everyone's time is wasted. I would suggest an alternative to this truly horrific RFI RFP process and submit to the vendors just two questions. What is your understanding of our business problem? And how do you propose to solve it? The vendor can then demonstrate their knowledge and their creativity in solving the customer's problem. And the capability details will be uncovered during this discovery process. When evaluating software vendors, beware of the dirty tricks of selling, such as only showing fit to history, which I mentioned before. Also be aware of claims about return on investment. There are elaborate financial spreadsheet calculators that purport to show the precise payback from, say, a 1% reduction in forecast error. But I suspect that these are mostly nonsense. <clears throat> Certainly, better accuracy is preferred to worse accuracy, but how much difference will a slight improvement make? Suppose the company has overall forecast accuracy error of 30%, and it gets reduced by 1%. So the overall error is now 29.7%. Will anyone notice? Will anyone care? Will planners suddenly become more confident in the forecast and change any decisions or actions they take? Probably not. There's also the fundamental issue of establishing and quantifying the direct cause and effect relationships that lead to improved performance. You know, what if you successfully implement an expensive new system and in a booming economy, your company has a successful year of growth and prof profitability? Was it due to the new system? you are probably credit it to that. But alternatively, what if after the successful implementation, the economy sours and your company starts losing money? Will you blame the new system? Probably not. You also need to be skeptical of customer references. Sometimes they're given in exchange for discounts or other special considerations from the vendor. Also, when you speak to a reference, remember they are likely engaged on the implementation project and were responsible for selecting the vendor. So they have a conflict of interest. If they criticize the vendor, they make themselves look foolish. So they will always put the best light on the implementation. You're probably better off going to the vendor's users group than trying to secure more candid appraisals from existing customer users. And also be aware of potential conflicts of interest in the relationship between vendors and the industry analysts who cover them. It's good to assess the situation, uh, assess the situation at the start of the project, making sure that there are, there are sufficient resources and management commitment to the project. 
a project falling behind schedule or going over budget is not necessarily an indication of pending failure, since probably most projects uh, don't keep perfectly to the original budget and timeline. But are once committed resources being pulled off to new priorities? And has executive management lost interest in the implementation project? Like rats on a sinking ship, project staff will distance themselves from an impending failure. Setting early hurdles for go and no-go decisions force you, to face, force you uh, to face the organizational commitment to the project. If it's lacking and the project is doomed to fail, kill it sooner rather than later. There's no need to get your organization into quagmire like so many organizations have with pro uh, projects dragging on for months or years that drain the treasury and continue a project, you know, draining the treasury uh, when you realize the project was a bad idea and it's not going to succeed. So we'll wrap up this presentation with Paul's 10 guidelines for getting the best out of your forecasting software. Of course, even the best software with the best forecaster and forecasting process does not guarantee you'll achieve the level of accuracy desired. Forecast accuracy is ultimately limited by the nature of the behavior being forecast. For example, if you're forecasting heads or tails in the toss of a fair coin, you'll be right just about 50%, you'll be right 50, just 50% 50 of the time over a large number of trials. No matter how much computational power and statistical sophistication you apply, the amount of randomness in the behavior has determined the limit of your accuracy. Paul points out that point forecast is just an average outcome that would occur if the period uh, we're, for, uh, we're forecasting was repeated many times over with many different sets of random events occurring each time. Managers probably don't understand this, so they perceive the forecast as always being wrong and blame the forecasters. Until management is better educated, this is the profession that, that we find ourselves in. The first guideline is to restrict judgmental interventions to circumstances where you have reliable information about a forthcoming event that is likely to have a big effect on sales and that you know has not already been factored into the computer forecast. Paul also suggests documenting the reasons for making a change. Now, I personally feel that documentation is not valuable because you'll go back and look at the reasons. And in my years as a practitioner, I didn't find people had the time to go back and look at things like this. Everybody was too busy on their current needs. However, forcing people to document reasons is a good thing, I believe, because then people won't waste their time on small or unimportant, adju unimportant adjustments that probably shouldn't be being made anyway. It takes an effort, if it takes an effort to make an adjustment, you'll only make the adjustment for a good reason. Also, Paul recommends, as I do too, to monitor the FBA of adjustments. You want to be able to see whether adjustments are adding value by actually improving the forecast or if they're just wasted effort. Now, large scale automatic forecasting software is available and is a cost effective way to generate forecasts without needing an army of forecasters and data scientists to build and maintain your forecasting models. For large enterprises with thousands or even millions of forecasts to create, automating is not an optional, it's a necessity. Plus, automation helps you avoid a lot of the biases and personal agendas expressed in judgmental forecasts and lets the forecasters focus on the more important and problematic forecasts, letting the, the rest run on autopilot. There's no harm in providing as much historical data as available to the computer. This helps the model separate randomness and sales forecasts from underlying systematic patterns. And as conditions change, good automatic modeling software can detect it. It's especially important for consumers of the forecast, executives, and downstream planners to understand the point forecast comes with uncertainty. If you can express that uncertainty with a prediction interval or other method, all the better. The level of uncertainty will help make better planning decisions. Just be aware that PIs usually underestimate the uncertainty. And for various psychological reasons that Paul goes into in his foresight article that was referenced above, people often react negatively if the PI is too wide. A wide PI is often deemed to be uninformative and useless, even when it correctly expresses the level of uncertainty in the point forecast. The common assumption exposed in the early M forecasting competitions is that a model's fit to history is a good indicator of its ability to forecast. This assumption is wrong. Forecast accuracy will almost invariably be worse and often much worse than the model's fit to history. So don't fall into the dirty trick of selling software where the vendor only shows you 
to fit the history. Fitting history is the easy part. Anyone can do it, and anyone can create a model that fits the time series history perfect. But forecasting the future is your objective, and that is much more difficult. Also, don't assume a more complex model will perform better than a simpler model. Again, the early competitions exposed this reality. Instead, always compare proposed methods to simpler methods like a naive forecast. Make sure added complexity delivers forecast accuracy improvement that is worth the cost and effort. And be aware that complex methods may be more difficult to explain to management. Bias is an underutilized performance metric. Chronic bias in the forecast is a frequent problem. And by exposing the problem of management, there's, there's some hope of resolving it. So also, there's no need to create overly granular forecasts if you don't need the granularity for decision making. Daily forecasts are unnecessary if you operate with a weekly planning and replenishment cycle. So just do weekly forecasting. Likewise, individual customer level forecasts are likely to be unnecessary. You only need to know the total demand for the product by distribution location to, to plant supply and inventory. And demand at lower levels of granularity will always be more erratic, often intermittent, cannot be forecast as accurately as more aggregated levels. Years of evidence show that combining forecasts created by different methods will usually lead to better accuracy. Just a simple average of a few alternative methods should be beneficial. The only warning is to be aware of poison models, that is methods that are inappropriate to the data and may harm accuracy. And last for number 10, I don't think uh, I think everyone here knows this, and Paul doesn't even go on to explain it. So with that, thank you all for joining today. And I guess, uh, Paul, I guess we can open up if there's any time for question or discussion. Yeah. Do you want to? Thank, thank you very much, Mike. That was, that was just fantastic. Um, let me see if anyone... Um, as a question, otherwise I have plenty of questions. <laughs> okay, and, and just I'll we'll offer this out also for people to be able to contact me later if anything comes up or if they see it on the YouTube video and have something. Okay, fantastic. Baman, I may have a question, please. If, uh, Go ahead. Yeah, first, thank you. Thank you a lot, Michael, for your presentation. I think it was very interesting. I have, I have two questions. Uh, my first one is regarding new product demand forecasting. I was wondering just if, uh, if there is a benchmark for, for the values of accuracy measures. For example, what are the typical values of, uh, let's say, the mean absolute percentage error when we do uh, new product demand forecasting? So this, was my, uh, this is my first question. And my second question is, uh, do you know, please, if, uh, if there are free access uh, data sets which are suitable to test uh, a new method for a new product demand forecast. So yeah, this okay. are my two questions. Thank you. Great. Um, regarding benchmarks, I am not aware of any trustworthy benchmarks for new product forecasting. Um, the uh, organization I mentioned, the, the Institute uh, of Business Forecasting uh, is a practitioner organization based in the US they publish benchmark surveys periodically. Um, you may be able to get them off their website, or I don't know, you may have to be a member to get access to them. But the problem with those is I don't believe they're very trustworthy. Um, what they do is they, at their conferences, they'll just hand out a survey to attendees or to their members, you know, and ask them, you know, what is your, what's the accuracy are you achieving on a new product forecast? And uh, there are a lot of problems with the benchmarks. You know, I'm not sure the people actually know the answer. There's no, there's no auditing of the data to make sure the answers are correct. Uh, there's no, uh, you know, we don't know that they're using the same metrics. You know, even different flavors of MAPE, MAPE, weighted MAPE, symmetric MAPE, and so on can give widely different values. So unfortunately, no, I, I'm not aware of trustworthy benchmarks of new product forecast accuracy. Um, regarding data sets for testing, um, I can't think of any, well, I, I, let me tell you, actually, let me think of, point, point out one. Um, the DVD example I gave was from the uh, MDBA, uh, M. MBDA, oh, I'm sure, the motion, MPD, whatever it is. Ah, uh, IMDB. 
I think. IMDB, yeah, the motion picture industry's data set. They, I believe, post public data sets out there of sales, you know, movie ticket sales, uh, DVD sales and that sort of thing. Um, that was where we pulled that data for the example that I worked through. So that might be an interesting bow to. Also, a gentleman many years ago uh, put out a, uh, a big list of publicly available data sources. I have not looked at that in all the years and I can't remember where it was. It's something I can dig up and forward the information um, to the, you know, back to the group. So let me just take that as an action item for myself to see if I can find some sources for you. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Mike. Thank you. It's clear for me. Is there any other question? Any, anybody? Okay. Um, well, I have a couple of questions, Mike. It's just maybe, um, I mean, I, I'm trying to explain them briefly, but yes, the first question I have is I'm trying to, to think what are the situations in outside, you know, commercial supply chain where we have this, this sort of thing like new, new forecasting, um, new product forecasting, and then whether we can use these approaches that you discussed them uh, here or not. One example that came to my mind is, um, is actually here in Wells, very recently they developed um, a major, major uh, trauma network in, uh, in Wells. So basically, instead of having a decentralized system, they have a centralized system now. And then, of course, this will change the patient flows, you know, to the to the whole system. Do you think we can look at this as a as a sort of new new product forecasting type of thing, or it is just uh, now we have a de decentralized system, and then now we have a centralized system. Still, we can connect these two things together. Yeah, I think it's definitely a new product forecasting type of a situation. And I, again, I, you know, I think you probably detected from my presentation, I'm kind of a, a skeptic in the sense that I think it's good we've got a lot of methods and things that we can try, but you know, we're dealing with something entirely new. So we've got to be very realistic in the expectation of, of what's going to happen. So there definitely may be opportunities there that uh, using some of these approaches to that kind of a situation. When I worked in industry, I, I don't think I described, I've worked about oh, 15 or almost 20 years in industry forecasting jobs before I joined uh, SAS. And you know, the, the best thing I found for determining the new product was unfortunately not before it was released, but once it was released and you started getting in, you know, a few weeks, a few periods worth of sales, it started to give you a much better sense of what was really going to happen. So I think one of the keys in new products, hopefully you don't have to make a big commitment in front of time. Sometimes you do have to bet the company. You do have to make a huge decision committing, say, capacity, you know, a new production capacity or something like that uh, in advance or a utility industry. You know, if you, for, you're trying to forecast 10, 20, 30 years out for electric utility capacity, you've got to invest billions of dollars, say, to build a new plant to, to provide the electricity. Those are very tough situations. But if you're in a place where you can kind of go with the flow, let uh, actuals start coming in to you see how they're doing and then react accordingly, that is a much better situation to, to be in. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm unfortunately, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't provide no, 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 a ton of help on solving these, but at least no, providing some of them. That's perfect. I, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm currently involved in a sort of project like this, and uh, it is in interesting, you know, because they have shiny buildings, fantastic equipments, and then it, it sounds like they just for forgot about, you know, the operation, operational side of this. And then, of course, forecasting and planning is one of one of this sort of thing. Um, and I, I, yeah, I was wondering, yeah, whether we could approach this sort of problem with the new forecasting kind of product thing. Okay, so the uh, my second point is, of course, this is about the good fit and good forecast, and we know all all the the, the stories about this. Uh, recently, I I I developed a, a simple uh, sort of multiple regression model 
for uh, for NHS uh, board here in the UK. And so one thing I had to explain to these people were, was actually a good feed, whether good forecast, because I had a model where I had around, if I look at the adjusted R squared, I had around um, 80% or 76% to be precise of, uh, of our uh, adjusted R squared, which explains, okay, this model actually explains the variability in the data better than others. But that model gave me a terrible forecast. Instead, I, I had a better model with, if I look at the out of sample forecast accuracy, but that model gave me only 56% of uh, adjusted R square. Mm -hmm. So if you want to explain this to pr practitioners, how, how, how would you do this? Yeah, that, that's something I know is completely counterintuitive out there. Uh, one way is to just go into a very extreme case and throw some data points up there. I've, I've got an example uh, I, I'll send you as a follow-up. Yeah. And fit, uh, what I did was I just took four data points yeah. and I started out with, you know, how would we, how, how might we model this? Well, first, the first thing would just be take an average. So you've got a flat line. But, and it has a certain level of fit, not very great, but we don't have a whole lot of information. Maybe this is the best we could do. But can we make a more sophisticated model? Well, let's do a, a linear, linear fit to it. So we've got now a slope. The fit error is reduced. And now we see a forecast that's kind of going in the upward direction. Then fit a, I fit a quadratic equation to the, to the four points. Yeah. Again, we get a curve. And now at the tail of the curve is now either pointing way up or way down because of a, the quadratic equation. And then finally, I fit a cubic. Now the cubic equation fit the data perfectly. So fit history, fit to history was perfect, zero error. And yet the curve exploded way up to an obviously unrealistic number of future values. Yep. So using that, you, that kind of extreme case you, you show, fit to history is not the, the most relevant thing here. You can, in this example, even though it was a concocted example, our fit to, as our fit to history improved, our, the appropriateness of the forecast became much worse. And that may help them understand the situation you're in, where it's not nearly so extreme, but the worst fitting model actually created a forecast that was much more appropriate. And you can also maybe, you know, mention just kind of the randomness issues in there that, you know, as you increase the fit, you're probably touching into some just randomness in the numbers, which is really not what's going on. You know, it's not in the really the, the, the inherent structure of, of the data. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So what, what you, you suggest is maybe d demonstrate this with an example and then they will understand what is going on. You know, yeah. Yeah. Happening. Yeah. Okay. Great. So another important question I had is about this, you know, um, point forecast and, uh, prediction interval or probabilistic forecast. Um, so the way, the way we present the forecast. And again, I think we, we probably we understand this, but as you said, in, in practice, there is a misunderstanding of what is actually a, a forecast. And probably they don't even know we can present the forecast in other ways because they just, the, the understanding of forecasting is just a single number. Mm -hmm. Now, I think the most important part of this, you know, providing uncertainty around the forecast is how we translate this to, to decisions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, again, I'm, I'm involved in a, in a paper, um, and then our idea actually in this paper is go uh, to, to, so is a scheduling problem in an in emergency department. We have a scheduling problem, and then we want to fit different forecasting models to this, not only point forecast, but quantiles as well. Okay. So now if you, if you provide the point forecast to this, to this scheduling algorithm, let's say it goes and calculates different objective functions like um, how many staff you need and then uh, corresponding, uh, corresponding cost, for example. So, and then what we did, so we fit the algorithm once with the point forecast and the second time with, uh, with the quantile. Uh, 95 percent and 99 percent quantiles and then the outcomes we got from this is actually if i fit the the, the point forecast then the algorithm tells me is um i, I need only five nurses uh, to schedule a particular day 
But if I provide the, the quantiles, like 90, uh, 95% of quantiles, it, it tells me you need 34 people uh, for that particular day. Okay. Which is unrealistic, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and again, that is, what, that is because we, we tell people, look, if you want to prepare for worst case scenario, uh, I mean, not that worst case scenario, but if you want to pr prepare for extremes, and then yeah. you, you don't want really to, uh, to, you know, to, to have people waiting in your emergency department, probably that's what you need to do. But uh, what, what I'm actually trying to say here is, maybe we don't really understand well, at, I, I don't know, in, in practice, I'm sure we don't know this, but even in academia, then how we, when we talk about uncertainty, uh, pro prediction intervals or probabilistic forecast, then how we really translate this to a decision, um, I think this is something we, we need to, to investigate more, but I just wanted to have your opinion on this as well. Yeah, that's, it's true. The recipients of the forecast are generally not familiar with any kind of level of uncertainty to go with it. Um, and of the methods that are provided, you know, I, to me, the value in the uncertainty is not that it necessarily is ac exactly precise, you know, that, so I don't really care that much that the 95% PI is probably underestimated in its width and so on. But just getting a visualization out there of, you know, is it wider, is it narrower, gives the decision maker at least an indication of the uncertainty so they can maybe take that into account in, in making the decision. I mean, your case, of course, is very extreme. And it's, you know, it's probably, the problem is when it's, when there is a, realistic PI or, or in your, you know, any indication of uncertainty, if it's too wide, too extreme, people tend to disregard it. Paul discusses this in his, his article where he touches on a lot of the psychological literature. So it's, it's real, it's, you know, kind of a tricky, tricky situation you've got to, to deal with as a person presenting that information, because even though it's accurate, accurate re representing uncertainty, if it's too wide, people will say, well, this is worthless. I can't do anything with this information. Um, and there's one study that pointed out that people would prefer a narrow PI band, even if it doesn't include the true value, to a wide one that does include the true value. So it's, it's just kind of weird stuff going on with the way people think and, and decide. Um, yeah, just, yeah. I think that, yeah, so, I mean, just a follow-up question, though. Do, do you think we can have um, a systematic approach to integrate um, prediction intervals or probabilistic forecasts in a decision-making system? Or it is more like, you know, as you say, we show it to a decision-maker that just makes sure they're aware of this uh, uncertainty and then they make a decision following this. So do you think having a systematic integrated approach is possible? I think it's it's ultimately possible, yeah. And it's it's nice to see there's so much more interest in the whole this whole subject area. You know, over the last few years, when I start, I mean, I was my start my career thirty five years ago in forecasting. You know, I didn't know anything about this. Yeah. Um, and I never thought about it, and I don't think anybody in the business ever thought about this. But now it is in a lot of people's minds. Of course, it isn't everywhere in industry out there. I think most of the business forecasting being done is still pretty primitive and not much advanced from where I was 35 years ago. But, you know, there, there's definitely awareness of it and advances being made. And I think there is definitely hope of it being able to, being able to systematically applied in our systems and decision-making. Yeah, fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Mike, for, for your time. If you have anything to add, otherwise I will stop the recording and... Uh... Mm -hmm. Hey, that's it again. Thank you all for for sitting in, and look forward to hope meeting y'all at a future uh, IIF someday when we get when we get back together again. Thank you all. <laughs>